Every human being that comes to this planet has a fight. The ultimate opponent is actually the truth. The truth will wean out everything else. Fighting for your identity, for who you are for real, is one of the hardest things you have to do. Boxing, I think, is conquering not only your opponent, but yourself. You've got to transcend your fear and reach deep down to a part of you that you may not even know is there. The heroic nature of boxing is something that's undeniable. There is skill, there's expertise, but there's always this possibility of tremendous loss. In boxing, it's just the anticipation. It's one punch and it's all over with. A lucky punch can turn a guy into a star. And being caught when he's not looking can turn a star to a shadow of himself. Rich kids don't go into boxing. You know, boxing is a way out of the ghetto. One minute a boxer is not getting anything, the next minute he's signing a contract for millions of dollars. How do you handle that? The sport itself, there's a purity to it, but the business might be the most unsanitized of all businesses. Boxing is one of those sports where the toughest motherfuckers in the world are letting some guys that couldn't make it take advantage of them. It's a reflection of our society and your ability to achieve dreams, but it's also a reflection of our society and the fact that we are unquestionably divided between the haves and the have-nots. It's, it's... It's not an easy way to make a living, and it's the most dangerous sport there is. But that's the risk you take. Youngest of nine in my family. As you can see, I'm black. <laughs> I'm born black, and and you know came from uh, you know people called it the ghetto. My mother didn't read. My father didn't read, and so you know they were hard worker, and that was my beginning. You live in a project, people throw their trash on the ground. We was a family that picked the trash up and put it in the dumpster. And you know, people look and would laugh at us. My mother said, you know, you live in this environment, you don't have to be like that. Of course, people had money and they used their money in the wrong way. My mother didn't buy clothes or toys. She bought food. She know that this is what we need to, to be able to live. My upbringing, it was um, four sisters, three brothers. Coming out of Philadelphia, it's, it's a task itself, especially in the inner city called North Philly. In the morning, we get up, my mother's saying, okay, get up, get up ready to school, this and that. You had to ration out two cans of pork and beans with six kids and try to mix other stuff in there that Call it something different, Mom. It's the same pork and beans. It just got other meats in it to make it something else. My father was one of those guys that got up every day, did what he had to do. I never seen him sell drugs, anything like that, but I know that he used drugs. I know that he drank. So I had the two parents structure in the house, but it was a family where, you know, we was we tight, but it was some things that wasn't as, as I would say, normal family would be. The worst characteristic you could think of black life is where I stem from. A lot of drugs, tons of violence. My parents, old women, they, uh, they was in the sex industry and stuff, and that's what they did. We weren't safe in the house. We were always vulnerable. A lot of men sleep with my sister, beat me. There was a pattern of uh, abuse that Mike experienced. Bullies in the neighborhood, which routinely would pick on him. 
but also Mike was beaten by his mother. His father was pretty much absent. My mother was very promiscuous. It was just um, the way life was. Everybody I knew had just their mother at home or her mother's boyfriend. Nobody was ever his father. I don't know that well. My whole world is just lost kids with broken homes. You know, forget poverty. I don't care how much uh, money you get or fame. You know, forget that. Poverty hurts and leave an everlasting effect, um, impression on you. Poverty has its own self-perpetuating logic. When you are strapped for cash uh, and you need to survive in the short term, you start to adopt certain practices that in the long term end up preventing you from taking advantage of all the opportunities that may be out there for you. We came on the era where it really got a little worse, where nobody had anything. You couldn't tease me about my mother being on welfare because your mother was on welfare. Childhood poverty oftentimes leads to adult poverty and get locked in these ruts. So not only are they in these, these worst environments, but they have, find it much harder to escape. All these ills work together to create very strong barriers to upward mobility. It's been very hard to still believe the American dream is out there. The American dream is something that we're all proud of, we all embrace, yet it's a little bit dangerous. America may be one of the richest countries in the world, but we also have the largest pockets of poverty in the developed countries. One in five children in the United States grows up in poverty. America has by far the most unequal distribution of income and wealth in the developed world. Yet, the idea of the American dream is, in a sense, what keeps the whole system running. I know what it is when people move away from you because they think that they're going to catch what you got. They think they're going to get poor if they get to know you. I was just always searching for something. I didn't like my life at home. So I wanted to have a family somewhere else. I tried to find a new family. People that I hung around was in the same situation that I was in. You went on like you was going to school, but in reality, we was in the area, but not in the classroom. We stayed around the school, but not actually in the school. And eventually, people do find out. But after a while, you get lost in the system. When I went to school, they said we wasn't going to be anything. They said we're going to be statistics. You're not articulate. You don't know your ABCs, your little simple stuff. And my mama always said, so they read better than you. Who the fastest in your school? I said, fastest in what? She said, running. Who run the fastest? I ran to everybody. My mama, there's things that you do better than that person. I said, but mama, they don't talk about that. Your day will come. My goal wasn't to be president of the United States. My goal was to be the baddest guy that I can be. We just basically looked at school as being no fun, no action. And if you do catch us there, this gym where we get to play basketball, we get to do things that we thought that was more important than reading and writing and science and history. I stopped going to school because people were kicking my ass. And I just walk around the, um, the school till school is over because I don't want to get my ass kicked. One day these guys came around, my three or four guys, they pinned me up against the wall and they said, hey, you got any money? I said, no. So the guy says this, he said, um, do you want to fly with us? And I didn't know, I'm just a kid, 10 to 9. I said, okay. So I'm helping these guys to this building. This is like I'm bad in the buildings and I see a box and it's pigeons and pigeons are flying. I said, what the hell? Now I know it's a place to hang out with birds and these guys. So I said, okay, I'd rather be there than be in school and get bullied. So I went back to the coop. I said, need me to do anything for you? They said, yeah. And he took me and robbing houses. And, um, whoa. And um, he didn't give me much money. But he bought me clothes. Yeah, he bought me clothes. There are a number of reasons, I think, why he kind of embraced the thug life. One of which is if you have a community of people who are watching your back, then you're going to be protected. 
and now he's buying the coolest velour sweatsuits, and he's buying ski goggles, even though he's never been anywhere near a ski slough, and he's buying the greatest kicks. So now, you know, status at that in that environment is who looks the coolest. The role models that I seen was the people in the street, the pimps, the number writers, the hustlers. They had the cars, they had the jewelry, they had all the things that shines in your face. As you grow up and you grow up fast, you get to know what they're doing is not right, but got them a lot of things and made them live different or better than every working class person in the streets. That's the situation for a lot of young people out there. You know, they could step off the porch with all the values in the world that mom gave them and dad can give them. When they step off that porch into that den, they gotta deal with it accordingly. You can go out there and turn the other cheek if you want to. All they gonna do is hit you in the head and take that earring too. So you had to adapt. Those that adapt well become predators out there themselves. To me, it wasn't a hard choice. I was the type of guy that had no conscience of value of my life and repercussions of what I do. When you think that the value of your life is not that much concern on your actions, and that is a time bomb waiting to blow. Ain't no rule. You don't get disqualified for busting a nigga over the head with something. When you get hurt bad, either your fear consumes you or you become a bit insensitive. Either you're gonna be a punk or you're gonna start to harden up a little bit following that. However you handle yourself, you make it clear to people that you don't have a problem with it. Matter of fact, make them feel like you want this shit. In an environment that I grew up in, which was animal, which was survival of the fittest, which was do or die, you have to be strategic. Very few of us grow up in fear because we live in this. And we're told earlier we can't be afraid of it. Whenever we're confronted with an obstacle in the, in the streets of a, of a physical nature, the first thing we think of is how to dissect the obstacle. My dream started off when a coach told me I could be the heavyweight champion of the world. And I asked him, what was it? And he said, Muhammad Ali. He said, do you know Muhammad Ali? I said, yeah. And he said, you can be just like that. First goal was to be the boys club champ. I wanted to be great, because I already know how it feels not to be great. So I grew up in it. one fight, I became the boys club champ. Every year, I will win the tournament. Boxing's interesting in that it's an escape from the violence and the poverty of many American neighborhoods, but you're escaping through violence itself. People who fight, fight their way out of something. Whether it's poverty, whether it's jail, rich kids don't fight. Why the fuck would a rich kid fight? You know, poor kids fight. You want to fight your way to a different place. Boxing gives you a chance to literally fight your way through it. Boxers succeed based on their own work. If you keep winning and you keep succeeding, chances are eventually you're going to get an opportunity. Boxing is the ultimate representation of the American dream. It allows someone who came from nothing to achieve greatness. It's about his talent, his own skill, and his own determination. Boxing is such a special sport. I think most people don't choose boxing. I think boxing chooses them. You know, disadvantaged childhood, less, less fortunate kids in, in tough communities. And, you know, we grew up boxing at the Boys Club. We were able to go there, and, you know, we had somebody who cared about us, wanted to take us off the streets and give us something to do. If you look at the history of boxing over time, you will see some of the cultures and ethnicities that have suffered the most have always produced the greatest champions. Boxing both attracts and preys upon talent from disadvantaged communities. And it's almost like you can read a chart of history of disadvantage, in the United States at least, of which groups are struggling to make it, and then which groups have made it when they disappear really from the boxing scene. 
especially in America where you had the immigrants. You had the, the Jewish boxes, the Irish boxes, the Italian American boxes, African American boxes. Now is I would say predominantly Hispanic boxes now. There's a certain generation with Mike and Evander and Bernard, black kids who are disadvantaged and saw boxing as a way out. I lived in an all-black neighborhood, and everybody said white boys can fight. And that's my first time experience that people tell you lies, because that kid was white, and he beat me twice. I told the coach that I quit. I told him I didn't want to fight anymore, because I didn't think you can actually be a champion if you lost. So I went home and told my mom I lost, and I told her I quit. And she told me something that just had to impact my life even now. She said, son, everything is not gonna always go your way. If you quit, you'll never reach your destination. She said, what is your destination? I said, be the heavyweight champ of the world. Of course, I went back and I finally beat him. And that fight kind of kind of changed my whole aspect about winning. I kept getting in trouble with the law. One particular time I got in trouble and I went upstate New York. I had a reputation as a troublemaker there. I had to be locked down most of the time. You couldn't go outside with the rest of the kids. Weekends, I would see guys go on the other side. And I would say, what's going on? Because I would see guys coming back, swollen eyes, busted nose, busted lips. The most interesting thing about it is that they were happy. When they would come back, they're all beat up, but they're happy. And I'm saying, what's going on over there? And they said, Mr. Stewart is boxing with the inmates. Mr. Stewart is um, probably 160 pounds, white Irish guy. I never fought before with gloves on my life. I used to know I could beat Mr. Stewart, this white ass. I used to know I could beat him. I mean, it's flaring away, and um, he had hit me in my stomach, and I had went down, and I started throwing up everything I ate for two days. I was like, wow. So I asked him to start teaching me. He wouldn't teach me unless I started behaving around the facilities. And once I made my honor roll and I started doing one of school, he started teaching me how to box. Bobby Stewart immediately saw the potential of Mike. And Bobby said, if you're serious about this, I'll take you to see this old guy in Catskill. Soon as Custom Model saw me spar, he just planned my life out for me. First day he met me. Cus was a kind of gruff guy. Didn't display any emotion. At the end of that session, Cus turned to Bobby and said, this guy's going to be the future heavyweight champ of the world. At that time, I was about to be paroled back to New York, and he didn't want me to go back because he believed I would get in trouble or get killed. He asked me would I be interested in staying with him, and I said, why? Sure, I didn't want to go back to that disgusting, wretched tenements that we lived in. This guy had a wonderful, like, 14-room mansion, roads and stuff. I never saw that stuff. For the beginning of that period, Mike was still living in two worlds. While he was in Brownsville, he'd fall in with his old friends, and they'd go out and start jostling. Mike's first street mentor, this guy, Barkeem, I, I think they saw some pictures of Mike, you know, with Cus and with Camille, and they looked, and they said, man, Mike, these white people, it looks like they love you. And Mike said, yeah, yeah, they love me. And he goes, Joaquin says, what are you doing here, man? If I had white people that love me, I wouldn't stick around here. And everybody in the neighborhood is telling Mike, go, get out of here. At least 30% of all the families in Brownsville at that time had no father figures. I think when we look at boxing, we see a number of men who grew up without a father in the home. But what's key is they grew up in circumstances where the family was redefined. The trainers became part of this larger extended family. Cus would tell Mike that he was a colossus, he was a titan, and he's telling him this and building up his ego to a person who has absolutely no self-esteem. So it's a very tricky situation. I heard about this heavyweight that they were saying, this guy is dangerous, he's from Custom Auto's camp, and then he was trained by Kevin Rooney. When I finally seen him, I was like, man, you know, he was like, he was 
going through fighters like a hot knife on butter. From that moment on, you knew he was special. North Philly was known for a lot of fighters back in the 60s, 70s, and in the 80s. I got introduced to the amateurs, and I had the talent, I had the skills, but then as time went on, eventually I started getting respect as a street fighter, and I shot away from boxing. Every time I got stabbed, which was more than once, crazy it might seem, it gave more stock to who you are. In 1984, I was put in jail for taking money. At that time, I blamed the system for everything, even for my ignorance. That same year, my brother got in a fight, and a guy pulled a gun out. He tried to run. He got shot. They couldn't find him because he ran down the street, and when they found him, he was laying across the grass. So can you imagine my mom? It had to be hard on her to bury one son, and then get to see me being escorted by the sheriff's department from prison to view the body and then go back to prison. So basically, she lost two sons. So 1984 was, was a really challenging year. Both Mike and myself, we were both trying to make the Olympic team. There was a big emphasis placed back then, especially on the idea of your amateur experience and this Olympic experience. It was very much a place where your worth was going to be determined. Holyfield and Tyson got an early taste of what the other was about at the Olympics. That's when I got a chance to see him train. I'm one of the guys who kind of pride myself in working hard. And when I work in the gym with him, and I'd seen all the things that he would do, and I was just amazed. And I'm like, God, you know, shoot. 17 years old, he's just a kid, man. He's the only person in the gym that I could admit that I worked with. I didn't think nobody was going to beat him. Mike, unfortunately, lost to a guy named Henry Tillman. Didn't make the Olympic team. He was voted as an alternate. You know, I went to Olympic trials. I didn't make the Olympics, but the experience of going to the Olympics was just um, incredible. Van der Holyfield, he was just very competitive in the Olympics. He was just very hungry. Very hungry fighter, and he fought. He's my man, me. He was going to win the most outstanding fight, I thought, because he was knocking out everybody. He's beating everybody easily. Amanda Holyfield, United States of America, Kevin Barry, New Zealand. Holyfield came into the competition the unknown American, but he's known now, and he's only 21 years old. Look at Holyfield. He's ready. He's got the opponent hurt again. He's ready to put him away, even though there's no blood there. Evander launches a lethal hook that drops Barry, and everybody thinks, okay, fight's over, move on. All of a sudden, the referee starts motioning to the judges. He starts motioning to Evander, and nobody knows exactly what's going on. He makes the announcement that Evander is disqualified for hitting after he called stop. Nobody really heard the referee say stop. All they saw was a Vander drop the guy. Holyfield got screwed royally. He shouldn't have been disqualified against Barry. That was a joke. Controlling, controlling the anger, controlling the tongue. I sit there and tuck it. How cold cell made me bigger than life. This is unbelievable. Holy oh, 
Holyfield holding himself together. A raging controversy had reared its ugly head. Bill Simon, the president of the Los Angeles Olympic Committee, has gotten involved. It really is a full-blown controversy. He wanted that gold medal, but by responding to it the way he did, not complaining, showing a lot of grace, he probably emerged uh, from that Olympics as the most well-known of all those boxers, even the ones that had won the gold medal. That became his launching pad, was the Olympics, while Mike had to begin his pro career in obscurity. Cuss got me into thinking about the great fighters, and every time I failed, I go read about their failures and how they overcame their failures. Mike had a very high skill set, and he had a profound understanding of boxing and boxing history. And that's what made him special. When he wanted to know something, he'd sit there and watch numerous fights of guys from the 50s and 40s and 30s. He's like a boxing encyclopedia. What's the difference between a good fighter and a great fighter? It's how far they're willing to go and how much they're willing to endure. It's the hunger for the world. You want to be that champion. Once you get to know Mike, you know he was a very insecure human being, a very insecure fighter. So a lot of that tough guy image and a lot of the talk and the brashness was basically to hide his own insecurities. Every time he went in the ring, he was scared. It wasn't like he just knew he was going to win. But Mike also knew when he looked in that opponent's eye, he seen fear. Scared as I was fighting, I realized these guys were more afraid of me than I was of them. And that's when my whole game started changing as far as my, uh, my approach to it, fighting. Almost drove Richardson right through the canvas. I did all his early fights on ESPN, and he knocked everybody out in the first or second round. So you, you looked at it and said, wow. Anybody that wants to stay in the business for a long period of time, like myself, I plan on staying in boxing. I would like to box for at least a good 20 years, but I love the game. He took care of business tonight. Congratulations, Thank Mike. Thank you very much. I studied every fight that Mike fought and tell everybody, be quiet. I'm watching. But you know, to my own thing, I realized that was going to be the toughest fight in my life if it happened. This is the guy that I got to face one day. In prison, you have a lot of energy that's bottled up. From one way or the other, love it or don't love it, agree to disagree, it has to be released. After getting a few fights, I built the reputation on the block like I was building on the streets. I was known, don't fight me, you gotta stab me. At home, you can hide, but in those institutions, you have to see these people every day you wake up, someone is plotting for that vulnerability. You got to meet your fears every day. Things that going through my head was that I'll be dead before I'm 18, or I'll be in prison all my life, or that I'll be nothing. As I got more mature in jail and I started watching other people, I started saying to myself, what's wrong with this situation? I had to stop being ignorant. I started doing research. I seen something to me that really woke me up. Prison is a business. It's 50, it's 60,000 a year for one inmate. How can I keep myself from being an employee of this business? Oftentimes, the real problem with prison is the stultifying boredom. There's mountains of evidence that, that you know, the supermax prisons, where, where you're in a cell by yourself 23 hours a day, they literally drive people insane. Right? The people who leave are, are substantially mentally harmed by the experience. It's just not what we as humans are designed to handle. Having that thing that gives you something to do, to hold on to, can be a very powerful means of sort of getting yourself through the mind-numbing tedium. They had a little gym with a ring, with gloves, with sparring. And Smokey Wilson, AKA Michael Wilson, continued to say, come on to the gym, man. 
come on to the gym, stop fighting the block. You either gonna go in a hole or you're gonna get stabbed or this and that. So hey man, all right, yeah, I'll go to the gym. And I sparred with one of the known respected guys. I didn't knock him out, but I gave him a boxing lesson. And Smokey Wilson became my trainer. I got a chance to get back into what I've deviated from and used it to my advantage in the penitentiary. It came to a thing where now in prison you bet on each other. And I'm getting his reputation because now the block, the jail was buzzing. I became the celebrity boxing in the penitentiary. The boxing program was established in 38 penitentiaries from Philadelphia to Pittsburgh. And so we had boxing tournaments in jail. And Pill, Rock Crew, Dallas, Greater Ford, Smithville, Frackville, we on buses, escorted by guards with shotguns from one prison to another. I'm beating everybody in every penitentiary, and I become the middleweight state penitentiary champion. I fell back in love with boxing again. Boxing is the sport in which all others aspire to be. It's you and another guy, and who wants it more, and who's got the heart and the will and the desire, but it comes down to a lot more than that. Best combat is man against man. I mean, since the Roman times, the gladiators, it's human nature for people to compete against each other. Sometimes I feel so guilty I'm a boxing fan. I know on one level I'm not supposed to really be enjoying what I'm watching, and yet on another, I can't control myself. We're violent, we're animals, like any other animal. There's a release of aggression that comes with fighting. There's a drama to it. Boxing is theater. If it's not theater, you're fucking up and presenting it. To be ringside, and you're like, wow, this is amazing. The part for me that stuck was people are literally fighting for their lives. They're, they're fighting for their families. That's the thing that attracted me. It's an ancient, brutal, some would say barbaric sport, but there's something very interesting about the individuals who choose to try to perform at that level and risk what they risk in the ring. It's raw. It's something that appeals to our basic instincts of survival or, or, or battle. Nobody else is going in there with you. You can't call time out. It's like having a fight of blood. A fighter don't care who his opponent is. He might wait, bring him. It's a different mentality. They're a different breed. The fighters know what they have to sacrifice and give up to try to perfect their game. A fighter learns from walking through the fire. Dwight Muhammad Cowie and Evander Holyfield in their WBA junior heavyweight title fight. Of course, you remember Holyfield with the controversial bronze medal at the Olympic Games in Los Angeles. Since then, 11 successful pro bouts. Is 11th enough going up against someone of the experience of Cowie? The bell rings, and this is round one. And one of Evander's biggest challenges here uh, is going to be overcoming the psychological barrier of going 15 rounds for the first time. Just keeping your hands up for three minutes and moving around the ring. It's a tremendous exertion physically. But running around for 15 rounds, three minutes a round, throwing punches at a guy who's trying to hurt you and getting hit while it's all going on, there's just nothing like it. Holyfield was going for it. He doesn't want to go 15 rounds. He's only in round three and he's using so much energy. Cowie breathing very heavily, but he is relentless. A left and a right combination again. Boy, that combo has worked well for Holyfield. But now a big left, right, left coming back from Cowie. Holyfield back against the ropes and sliding away. Cowie's slipping an awful lot of those punches, Al. He missed about 10 consecutive punches. Cowie got underneath almost every punch from Holyfield. And came back and landed punches of his own. He saw the smiling shrug, and that is demoralizing to Evander. He, he built up some energy for a flurry, and he got nothing out of it. 
Just watching these two go at it, there's no way that I can imagine this one going 15. Whatever I hit him with, that guy never stopped coming. Now we're really going to get to see what kind of shape Evander Holyfield is in. He's only been to eight rounds once in his career. Evander Holyfield started this fight very fast, won the first round in convincing and impressive fashion. But the rounds have gotten closer and closer since then. Perspiration flying off the face of Holyfield as Cowie gets in. And he looks a little slower and slower as this fight moves along. When somebody breathing on you, and they have the right to hit you just as the right you have to hit them. It becomes a tough thing. A right left, right left combo to Holyfield. He's going to the stagger right now. This is just trench warfare. Right now, Dwight Cowie is winning it. The question is who's going to get their second win first? It's just like somebody putting a mask over your head and put your hand behind your back and throw you out in the middle of the ocean. That's how tough this fight was. Round 11 of Evander Holyfield's never gone this far in his professional career, or in his career period. And a big, powerful right. The likes of which we haven't seen from Holyfield in a few rounds. I'm a little bit surprised that Evander has been able to hang in there as well as he did. He tired a little bit, but he's come back and he's very much in the fight. Cowie's eyes are, are blood red. He has taken numerous shots. Breathing very, very heavily. Bloody in the mouth. Vander has a tremendous heart, Al. He's got it's a burning intensity. As these two try to chip away and chip away at the stamina of each other. Both men showing unbelievable courage and determination. I lost 15 pounds in that fight. They were talking about my kidneys were messed up. All I want to do is not die. Holyfield's eyes have that fire. He is officially a professional fighter. He can go these 14, and he will be able to go the 15 rounds. White Muhammad Kawi, who yesterday called Evander Holyfield mediocre, would not be saying that to us right now. And there's the final balance. I didn't die. I made it to the land. Then they gave me a bonus by giving me the belt. For the winner and new junior heavyweight champion, After that, I was a light heavyweight champion. But my goal, I never forgot my goal was to be the heavyweight champion of the world. Vander Holyfield started as light heavyweight, which is, you know, kind of like being uh, the vice president of the United States. <laughs> it's, it's not, you don't get a lot of attention. When you talk about boxing, for most people, you're talking about the heavyweight division. The heavyweight champ of the world is an icon. This is the main event of the night. The WBC Championship of the World in the blue corner with 27 wins, no defeats, 25 KOs, he is the challenger, Mike Tyson. And in the red corner, he is the WBC heavyweight champion of the world, Trevor Burpee. Any question from the challenger, Chief Second? Any question from the champion or Chief Second? All right, let's get it on. Come All right, on. with the words of Mills Lang, we're ready. I don't know about you folks, but here at the Hilton Hotel, there is electricity in the crowd. Mike Tyson has trained his whole life for this. And let's watch how quick Tyson will jump on Trevor Burbick. You get the idea now that Burbick uh, uh, is showing a little false bravado here. Tyson clips him with the left hand. Look at this. Combination. And Burbick ready to go, but he stays on his feet. Another right hand clips him. He can't take shots like this very long. And he gets Trevor in trouble, and he's down. As he steps right up the count to four and five and six, and seven, and eight, and he says he's okay. Mills Lane lets them continue. It comes Tyson again. He knows he can hurt him any time. Left catch him with the right left hook, and he goes down. He goes down. He should be able to get up from this. His leg may be shut. They are. As Trevor Burbick falls back in the rope, I don't know if he's going to be able to continue. He's got the heart, but his body won't let him do what his mind wants to. 
and he's counted out. It's all over. We've got a brand new heavyweight champion of the world, Mike Tyson. That was the most exciting moment in my life. People um, pat me on the back and think, wow, you're great. I never saw anybody like you before. It's incredible. How am I going to articulate this? Um, so all I dreamed about being a champion and stuff. This is very serious since I was 13. This isn't be like, hey, we're going to box and get some trophies, guys. No, our purpose is to win and win in spectacular fashion. I got so much trouble on my mind. Refuse to lose. Here's your ticket. Mike did something special. He convinced me that no man on the planet could beat him. You get up, go to the bathroom, come back to fight, fight over. Mike got a bad rap in the sense that people concentrated on intimidation. The only way you're intimidated is because you've seen him do something. When you see somebody knock out 22 other people, yeah, the 23rd guy may be a little intimidated. He was an unstoppable force in nature. I mean, I still, in my head, have visions of Welcome to the Terror Dome being played where Tyson was walking into the ring twitching with no socks on, and the guy standing in the ring looked like he was shitting his pants. But welcome to the Terror Dome! Don King told him, every time that you knock somebody out in the first round, I give you 100000 in cash. And he's down again! He's not going to make it. It's all over. First big fight I went to was the Tyson fight. And there was nothing more exciting than that. He put on a show. <laughs> when the lights came on, Mike just knew, this is my moment. Everybody's watching me right now. It was crazy in there. Just great energy, unbelievable energy. Every time we get home, Mike said, well, who came? How did they look like? He just wanted to know, like, what was the crowd like? And it's hard to explain it to him. You see Eddie Murphy. You see Donald Trump. You see so many big people in the audience. Like, if you was in that front three or four rows, you was somebody. Tyson was superhuman. He represented our culture. He represented who we were. Mike Tyson was a phenom. Everybody heard about him. Mike Tyson represents in the community the American dream that anybody can make it if they have the determination. Cuts put me in the mindset that there's no room for everybody. I need to suck all the air. I need to reign with gods. Do you ever stop to think about money? The stage of thinking about money is far gone. I don't have to worry about that no more. I'm just having fun. They were able to sell Mike Tyson very effectively. He delivered, of course, because he scored all these knockouts, and you got this feeling of caged fury. In our era, what would Box have been without Mike Tyson? Could you say it would have been next to the well, Welcome to the Teladome. After Ali, people stopped liking Box. It don't bother me to say that I, I was in the right time with Tyson. That's when the fire came back in the game of boxing. When Tyson came in the game, boxing became one of the most popular, if not the popular sport outside the walls of Greater Folk. And we used to watch fights on ABC, and we used to watch fights on ESPN. Alexis Oguel and the fighters that was hot and I'm like, yo, I can beat these guys. For myself to come out and be paroled to a halfway house, I said to myself, I got to make boxing work. I knew that this is the only thing that I had to gamble on. Most guys go back when you're in that situation. When they lock you up when you're like 17 and you get out when you're like 23, 24, now you're thrown into the adult world. And with no job skills, nothing but a record on your back. Plus, the little guy you seen on your block, he comes past you in, in a brand new car with, with a gold chain big enough for you to see your reflection in it. That's hard to deal with. When you go away, if you come back into the same environment, around the same circumstances, around the same people that you're comfortable making these decisions around, and you have influences to make things easy for you to be in a bad situation. Temptation is great. It's the same if you try not to be involved with drugs. Because of its low price, crack permeates the country, especially the inner cities. When the crack ever came into and flooded the streets, it was just hard to say no. The crack era affected everybody. If you lived in an area where they sold it, 
you were going to be involved. You're looking at your environment and no one's helping you. No one's doing anything. Just feeding you the drugs, feeding you the alcohol, feeding you the negative comments. They're doing exactly what was done to you as a child. So you have to shift and change your environment. Do something, change something. For Bernard, not violate parole during that era, during that time, was the most impressive to me. He dealt with it, he came home, he was able to move forward. He realized he, it wasn't the life for him, he was gonna make sure it wouldn't happen to him. How can I beat the system? I fought, I worked. I worked in the kitchen, I worked on landscaping, I did roofing, I found some new people, those new people got me into boxing, as far as on the business side. I was the only fighter, to my knowledge, that take a team of trainers and go to Greater Fort and train and use that environment to remind me where I came from. I think it speaks volumes about Bernard and how he looks at life, that he went back to prison with his team to look at the situation and know this is what I do not want to fall back into. There were athletes who came along who had better talent than Bernard. There were athletes who came along who had better positions, better situations. His discipline has set him apart. And the new IBF middleweight champion of the world, Bernard Hopkins. I won my first title. 1994. From there, I went on to defend the middleweight championship for 11 years. Oscar De La Hoya is knocked out by a left hook to the liver by Bernard Hopkins. Bernard Hopkins is already Robinson in this ever. Those guys were cut from a different cloth, the ones who could sustain. Tonight, you have witnessed history. Boxing's ageless warrior, Bernard Hopkins! He became the oldest fighter to win a world title. At an age 48, when it's almost impossible to imagine a fighter doing this. Bernard walked and kept that middleweight weight for 20 title defenses. 20 title defenses. That's going to be a hard record to break. He's just always represented a hungry fighter that dedicated and put in a lot of work, you know. You can just tell he didn't, get, he didn't get anything handed to him. Bernard Hopkins, to me, is a testament to the fact that anyone can reshape their thinking, can reshape their life, and continue to live that reshaped life. The Bernard Hopkins that I have known all these years and the man who resurrected his life is an absolute pillar of self-discipline. What saved me was knowing that I can do this, and to be able to do this in the penitentiary. Those stages are critical for me, to be able to come through that era and come through that time with the scars, but I used it to motivate me in a different way. It took time to get there. Bernard Hopkins is very lucky to have boxing and to capitalize on it. Right? He had it and then he, he, he took advantage of it. You know, people who don't have those options, it's, you know, it gets very bleak. We've cut back on a lot of the educational options, we've cut back on a lot of the facilities, we've cut back on time out in the yard, we cut back on sports. Energize inmates. Use their energy in the right direction by going to the boxing gym. It releases energy that won't be released on authority or on other inmates. Those kinds of programs are no longer available in today's prison. Today's prisons are more about punishment rather than recognizing the mistakes individuals may have made and helping them grow from them. Sometimes we do completely perverse things. In New York State, at least, the single most popular training program in prison is barber school. So you have thousands of men training to be barbers in, in prison. It's actually giving them a job to do while they're in prison, providing actually a, a useful skill they can use on the outside, only they're not allowed to use it at all. People on parole, ex-felons, can't be barbers. Blanket ban for licensing. Once you get into that system, we're actually setting you up even more to fail down the line. You just keep making it tougher and tougher, and then you know, shaking your heads in disappointment when they fail and making it tougher still. 
activist Angela Davis describes prisons as this place where we don't make problems disappear, we make people disappear. We want to think of ourselves as never making mistakes. And so when confronted with individuals who make mistakes, we're forced to look in the mirror. Muhammad Ali in his prime was served by his character. Mike Tyson didn't have that character. He had tremendous ferocity, tremendous ability, God-given strength. But the people around him weren't encouraging him to develop character. They were enabling him in a lot of ways to destroy himself. His only real mentors were his managers and his trainers. Uh, they weren't really trying to teach him a lot of social skills other than how to deal with media. People treat you differently when you're famous. Fame really distorts your own perception of yourself. Just think, anybody in this planet was six billion people? Six billion, right? Anybody in this planet you could beat them in a fair fight. So you tell me how that'll feed your ego. He starts buying all these incredible sports cars. He buys Bentleys, he buys Rolls Royces, and he starts buying these mansions. And of course, it's conspicuous consumption. He's showing the world that, you know, look how far he's come. My life only existed through accomplishments. You win this, you get this car. You win this, you get this. You win this, you get that. And you have that much money, you know, everything is possible. The media was creating this image, but Mike was helping him with the image. That he was just a savage, a wild man. If I fuck you in your ass, you punk white boy, I eat your asshole alive, you bitch. I became a megalomaniac. I thought I was a god. If you were old enough, you may have seen some of my fights and some of the things I said to people or said about myself, you know, as some kind of demigod or something. I'm a Tyrannosaurus, man. I'm a tyrannical titan. I'm the best ever. There's never been anybody as good. That's just the way I was trained to fight, to have that kind of belief system. We all heard those stories of people that have had nothing and then had it all and didn't know how to handle it. It's one thing to be able to have that drive and that desire to become a champion, but to stay hungry when you have that success, it becomes that much harder. We think of him as this monster with, with huge power, and he did have power. But Mike Tyson was a small heavyweight who needed to fight well to be effective. A Mike Tyson that isn't perfectly conditioned and a Mike Tyson that isn't fighting the right style, he's beatable. Please welcome the challenger, James Buster. Douglas! No one expected Mike Tyson to lose to Buster Douglas. The odds were astronomical. Introducing the undefeated, undisputed heavyweight champion of the world, the one and only Iron Mike Tyson! It was in Japan, and most news organizations didn't even send anybody to cover the fight. Give me a break, please. Larry, what are we about to see? Another 90-second annihilation of an ill-prepared opponent? Well, in the important game of expectations, this fight is over before it begins or soon thereafter. You have to remember that uh, just nobody believes anybody can compete with Mike Tyson. And there, of course, is Evander Holyfield, who has a guarantee of $12 million to fight Mike Tyson in June. Everyone was looking forward to Mike Tyson fighting Evander Holyfield. I watched the Douglas Tyson fight with Donald Trump and his executives. They were expecting that Tyson-Holyfield fight to be on one of their properties and would be a major event for them. Mike went kicking and screaming to Tokyo. You know, he thought, I knocked out guys that beat Buster Douglas, so why do I have to, you know, train for Buster Douglas? So he got there and he didn't train. And he instead enjoyed all the fruits of young Japanese women there. Buster had nothing to lose, and he was training his heart out. Now, Vander saw this, and he knew trouble might be on the horizon. This is getting Mike Tyson to reach in. When you reach in, that's what Another happened. good right hand and a good right uppercut and two more good rights by Douglas. I don't think I've ever seen Tyson absorb that kind of a four or five punch combination before in his professional career. And he has swelled up Mike Tyson's eye and is dominating the fight right now. 
it was a perfect storm of events it was mike tyson not taking buster douglas as seriously as he should have and it was buster douglas preparing himself correctly rolling willingly just to try to get in the shot that will finish things in oh, the uppercut. what an uppercut by douglas and down goes tyson There are a lot of lessons fighters learn the hard way. Every fighter comes to know the fact that this is an unforgiving sport. And suddenly, Mike Tyson has been reduced to being another heavyweight champion who got defeated. There's no other sport where you can rise and fall so quickly. When I became the heavyweight champion of the world for the first time, with Buster Douglas. People hated the fact. That time by holding, holy God. Right hand stuns Douglas. Caught him going in. He is not going to get up. There goes the heavyweight championship of the world. Evander Holyfield with a third round knockout. They said, you can't get no credibility from me. You still ain't the champ. You ain't beat Tyson. An Indiana grand jury has indicted former heavyweight boxing champ Mike Tyson. He is charged with raping a woman who was a contestant in this summer's Miss Black America pageant. Within the past hour, the jury has returned four indictments, one for rape, two charges of criminal deviant conduct, and one charge of confinement. If I was in here for something that I did, it would, it, would, it would be easier. But just the fact that I'm in here for something I didn't do, and I'm innocent, is every day I'm, I'm walking a thin line through hell. I thought prison was for the rehabilitation of men, or women, or so to speak. That's what I always thought. That's what they say. We thin you here, and we really rehabilitate you before you won't do it again. People come out of prison, they come out, of, they come out in worse condition than they was when they first entered. In the lackluster heavyweight division, even without his crown, Tyson is still the man. Promoters even courted him at the prison, hoping to share an estimated $100 million payday. Waiting for my opportunity to get a chance to fight him. There's a lot of writers in general that think that really he's the champ. I'm here, but, you know, realistic, I am the champ. I have the best. Long before dawn, news helicopters hovered over the state prison, and cameras were ready hundreds of them from around the world. Tyson issued a written statement. I'm very happy to be out and on my way home. I will have more to say later. It was viewed as good versus evil. The good was Evander, the good Christian guy who talks about the Lord and things like that, versus Mike, who at that time was the ex-con convicted rapist. But Evander was perceived to have no chance against Mike. When the fight was first announced, Evander was a 25 to 1 underdog. I mean, that's huge odds for anybody to be 25 to 1. It's like they've got no shot. As expected, Mike Tyson comes out fast. I'm from the hood, too. I may not act like I'm from there, but I'm from there. Tyson never did insult me. But the press did. They talking about Tyson gonna kill you. As we head for the bell. They continue to go after the bell. Ain't nothing that he was gonna do that I'm not accustomed to. No intimidation factor here whatsoever. I knew he was gonna be tough, but I had watched him my whole life, and it's almost like this is the fight. Mike just wore down from not being able to hurt a vandal, and that was something that he had never experienced before. I can't believe what I'm saying. It's the most unbelievable thing I've ever been privileged to witness. 
It was one of the most complete fights I ever fought. That was Holyfield's greatest achievement. Evander Holyfield ended up being in some of the largest pay-per-view matches in the history of the sport. But it took him a long time to get there. Evander Holyfield was not just a good fighter, he was a great fighter. He's an underrated heavyweight in my mind. Very arguably belongs in the top 10 heavyweights of all time, even though he was a little guy, started as cruiserweight. Tyson, I don't think he became what he could have been. Boxing, as we imagine it, is driven by a desire to annihilate the opponent. The focus is on the external. And looking at what boxers themselves say is that it's about the internal, it's about the discipline, it's about the craft, that it's not about the opponent. It's not about the external, but it's about the internal. It's about self. When you win, everybody wins. When you lose, you lose alone. And that's the truth, because you have to deal with that by yourself. There's a large degree to which the fighter that achieves stardom, superstardom, they represent the American dream to people. I mean, they, the underdog that makes it. Um, but I gotta be honest with you, I think a lot of that's greatly overstated. You know, Mike Tyson, the biggest athlete by far of the 1990s, and you know, biggest athlete of the 1990s, and, 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 and a, a, certainly a superstar boxer, suffered a lot of ups and downs and was never really protected by the people that surrounded him for the majority of his career. That my self-worth, even when I was a child, was um, depending on how much I would, could hurt someone. And as I got older and I met Cuss, that's what it continued to be, how many, um, how many people I could knock out how fast I could knock them out, how bad I could hurt them. And so it just, um, it just stayed on that path. The kid doesn't have a normal home environment, doesn't have a normal support system around him, and then he's basically trained to be a fighting machine. His life was crazy. Tyson was a pit bull. The ear biting incident was a checkout. Mike was messed up. I'm sure he'd be the first one to tell you that. And you have to understand, this is just what I did seven years of my life, eight years of my life. My greatest moment is when I stopped boxing. It was just dark for me. Boxing got real dark for me. A stunned crowd here at the MCI Center in Washington, D.C. As Kevin McBride defeats Mike Tyson, who quits on his stool. I got the an ability to stay in shape, but I don't got the fighting guts, I don't think, anymore. When did you recognize that? At what part of the fight? I don't know. Early into the fight. Um, I'm just sorry I let everybody down. I, mean, I just don't have this in my heart anymore. Did you feel as though you had it coming into the fight? Um, no, I'm, I'm just fighting to take care of my, um, my bills, basically. We know from studies of lottery winners, of professional athletes, anyone who comes into a sudden windfall of money, be careful what you wish for, because that creates more problems. You have everybody coming out of the woodwork to try to get a piece of your action. Tyson has pulled in an estimated $300 million. He could have made more if he hadn't racked up the prison time. And who knows how much he's lost in lawsuits or to the managers he claims ripped him off. Bottom line, Tyson then, $300 million. Tyson now, Chapter 11. It's a sport where you can be used. There's no training uh, about how to handle yourself outside the ring. Very few boxers are taught about how to handle their money. If you don't have a good team of people around you, you will, you will kill yourself. You will crash and burn because every level of success you have, you hit a wall that you have to learn more. I'll always wonder why Mike Tyson didn't declare bankruptcy years before his tax issues became crushing. I mean, he clearly was bankrupt. Why didn't he declare bankruptcy? Because it was in people's interest to keep his contracts alive with those he was doing business with. Days after filing for bankruptcy, boxer Mike Tyson has filed suit against his former promoter, Don King. Like, Don was, I mean, he knew everybody. It's like he was a step ahead of us. 
how could you prepare for something like that? You don't know who's trying to take from you, who loves you, who likes you. You don't know if somebody's trying to set you up. Even when you play by the rule book, you find a person that has that same energy that the person had that was trying to rob you, but they won't even give you courtesy of pointing a gun at you. They'll rob you and do it in black and white. And I've seen people do worse things to you in corporate settings than I've seen them do on the street. They take everything from you. There are bottom feeders that will attach themselves with their law license, with their business savvy, to a fighter from Brooklyn, New York, Philly, or any other place that don't have really the education. Just ask Atlanta car dealer Ken Sanders, who took Holyfield under his wing when he needed a co-signer for a car and became his manager. Ken Sanders wasn't my manager. I just told people that because he ran a car dealership, so he knew about money. I got into boxing because all I had to do was know how to fight. I didn't know nobody who knew about money. I don't know nobody who made a lot of money. I mean, even when you hit the Powerball, the first thing people tell you is get an accountant and a lawyer. Well, boxing is the same way, but they don't tell you. That's why most athletes wind up not having nothing when all the hard labor and years in the ring is over. You ask Mike Tyson, how you doing, Mike? He says, just living the day to day. That's what he's doing, just living day to day. You can look at people like Evander Holyfield that made hundreds of millions of dollars, that's how, whose houses went into foreclosure and who's struggling right now uh, to get by. A foreclosure notice in the local newspaper states Holyfield defaulted on a $10 million bank loan, a strange reversal of fortune for a champion believed to have earned $200 million during his storied career. The house that Holyfield built may soon become his biggest loss outside of the ring. When you get money, you got to ask questions. I never did have to ask questions because I never had no money. What happened to me is not so much they stole it, but they did take advantage of what I didn't know. They all want this boxer to make them money. Once the boxer doesn't make them any more money, they're cast aside like rubbish. You retire with a great record and then be sitting on a stool in your living room, and where do I go from here? I don't have any skills. I'm not trained to do anything. I'm not educated. I don't have a college degree. A lot of guys don't have high school degrees. It's not at all uncommon to have even boxers who had great acclaim wind up broke, penniless, as greeters at a casino in Vegas. What you don't hear about is the guy that fights on ESPN four times a year, and after he pays his manager and his trainer and everyone involved, is still at the poverty line. The budgets on ESPN allow a guy in a main event to get paid about 15 grand. Like I said, split that money off, train for a number of weeks for that fight, and you're making, you can make more money honestly, taking a minimum wage job and working a little bit of overtime. The minimum salary in Major League Baseball, even in Minor League Baseball, is, is livable. There is no minimal salary for a fighter. I mean, the top 1% of fighters probably make 99% of money. Boxing is laissez-faire capitalism run amok. There is essentially no one running the ship. Uh, there's different organizations that run a piece of it. There's promoters who go up and down and control parts of it. But there are essentially no regulations. Boxing is regulated at the state level. You have Nevada with its set of rules. You have California with its set of rules. You have New York, you have New Jersey. Jurisdictions will have different perspective on a different matter and nobody is on the same page at all times. Most people think that we need a federal commission to regulate the sport of boxing. The federal government attempted to regulate boxing by the passage of the Ali Act. It's given some authority to the federal government to enforce boxing from a business perspective. However, there has not been any prosecution or implementation of the Ali Act for a fighter. Why is it every sport in America is regulated or have some type of union and boxing don't? In other sports like baseball, football, tennis, you have individuals who are well educated in those sports to help guide those champions through their effort and their time. 
if you're an NFL player or an NBA player or a Major League Baseball player, there is at least a core. You have the team. You have whatever resources they have to help you with. You have the league that has some resources. Who do we go to? It's crazy to put your body and your mind through this hard way of making a living for yourself and your family and to wind, to wind up with nothing. And not even your health, to me, is a sin. We, as a country, are in love with our sports. But when these two fighters step into a ring, there is a level of violence that is unlike any other sport in terms of duration and intensity. When a fighter receives a blow that's so severe, what's going on inside the head is the brain is suddenly slammed against the back of your skull and then thrown forward again as the head snaps back. It's commonly called a concussion. It can swell and cause long-term hematomas, bleeding on the brain, memory loss, strokes or aneurysms, or vessel breakage. It can cause death, depending on how severe, how acute, where the brain actually impacts the skull. It has happened where a fighter will leave the ring, whether they've won or lost, they look fine. They head out to dinner, everything's wonderful, and one to two to three days later, something you know traumatic happens. I had a young champion, a guy named Levander Johnson. He was walking out of the ring, I walked out of the ring behind him, and I saw he was a little unsteady on his feet. He put his arm on me, and I walked him back to his dressing room. He was apologizing uh, for losing, and I'll never forget it. He sat on his stool, then he looked at me and he said, Lou, I have a headache, and then he fell forward and uh, he never regained consciousness. He died, I think it was five, six days later. Every society, for the most part on the face of the earth, has some primal need for violence. It's always there, that bloodthirstiness. It's human nature to be fascinated by violence. We hear a car wreck, we go see what happened. Horror movies, how is somebody gonna be eaten alive or torn up. It's all over the place. We are just attracted by confrontation, by conflict, by controversy. That's what sells. And that's what boxing tries to sell. Boxing needs something that can say, hey, there is support for a fighter. The fighter is the one who's putting his life in danger to enter that ring and provide entertainment to everybody that's there. However, we have to weigh the resources we have with the actual regulation of the sport. Over the last year, we generated about five and a half million dollars in tax revenue just from ticket sales. The state legislature then makes an appropriation to the Athletic Commission, and that allocation is about $450,000. So there's a huge disparity from a regulative perspective. I'm concerned right now about the sport. People in life have a right to take risks and a right to live the lives they want to live. Now that being said, it's barbaric in a lot of ways that, that there's no standardized health and safety um, criteria in the United States. Think about that. You know, it's preposterous. It's high time that boxing began to regulate, just like, you know, other pro sports like in the NFL. When there's no checks and balances, there's a problem. When you see the people who come from nothing, who come from less than nothing, to see them perform, and to see them give such great entertainment is an amazing thing. But as important it is for us to celebrate them at the top of where they are, it's as important that we figure out how to carry them when they need us the most. There are some great success stories and some great stories of those who escape prison, escape the street, and make it. But for every one of those guys, there's a sad story. And there's a story of someone who's exploited or a story of someone who loses their health in the long term or a story that somebody who becomes a champion and toils for years and then winds up retiring with virtually nothing. It's the American dream and it's the American nightmare.
when I'm over here and I'm looking at the Vegas Strip, I ain't think about all the trouble I got in over there, all the drugs I used there. I never even think about all the great fights I had there. I used to think about all the things I did there wasn't really moral. All I did is knock people out, screw people, have sex with women, get high on drugs. When me and my wife first got together, I was a full-blown addict. My daughter passed away at four years old, having a tragic accident at home. That's my lowest point. When I was at that hospital, I realized that other people's children were dying too. And those people, um, just because I'm famous, they took out of their way, left their dying children, their sick children, came over here and prayed with me. Then I realized, well, hey, they're paying their babies dying too. So what's the, what makes you so important that you think you should be mad and angry, want to kill somebody and do, just do this whole tough guy stuff because your baby's dying. Their baby's died too and they left them to come over here and talk to you. You ain't shit, motherfucker. You don't care about nobody. These people left their fucking baby to talk to you no good a fucking ass. And um, that's just what it was. And it's not about me. The world's bigger than me. My wife just stayed by me and said, we're going to get through this. She just kept it very positive, constantly positive. I just wanted to change. I wanted to break the chain of self-bondage that my mother and father and her mother and father probably had, and I wanted to change with me. So my kids wouldn't have to deal with that same suffering. I'm just so happy to be involved with the recovery world. I met a bunch of people that were just amazing people. They didn't quit on me, they didn't give up on me like the rest of the people in my life. And it's an ongoing struggle. The pain never goes away. I'm never in a situation that I'm so secure that I can never fall back into that nasty, dirty, disgusting, wretched individual that I once was. I never think that guy's gone totally. It's time now where I have to deal with things from a serious perspective and how me and my family are going to evolve from that perspective. You have to make adjustments. Adjustment is part of life. Disappointment, that's the biggest fight. You want to see how strong somebody is? Let them get disappointed. It's over. That's, That's over. it. Okay. It is over. That's it. Over. Evander Holyfield has never been knocked out, and Riddick Bowe is the one to do it. If I was Holyfield or any of his team members, I'd really have to reevaluate if he's fit to continue to fight. With all the health problems and the heart conditions, is Evander Holyfield just completely done? We don't know. My mother passed before I fought Mike Tyson. My brother passed before I fought Reddit Poe. I had a lot of tragedies in my family and stuff that, you know, you had to put them behind. And the continuing life in the ring of Evander Holyfield. Don't count me out yet, he says. And tonight with some new gas in the tank. Evander Holyfield was an all-time great. But Evander didn't understand that the shelf life of a fighter is limited. We may be seeing the end of an era. He was forced to fight way too long. Fights at the end of his career for virtually no money. Evander is very confident in what he believes. His stubbornness can be his greatest asset and his greatest liability. I didn't get in boxing for money. I got into boxing because I wanted to be the very best. I'm the only person who's been heavyweight champion world five times because I got that many opportunities. Everybody going to get off the path, but the point is to get back on it. Forgive yourself and get back on Evander Holyfield has faced plenty of opponents in the ring, but nothing like this. Together with his friend and financier, Yank Berry, they plan to deliver food aid and help resettle Syrian refugees in a home supplied by Berry's charity. Yank Berry used my likeness to, to draw the people. I was on my last leg. 
But this man gave me an opportunity to fight back these people who were taking my memorabilia and all this. He did it himself. I think Evander has come to that realization that he needs to be a Vander Holyfield and not necessarily a Vander Holyfield four-time heavyweight champion of the world. If it wasn't for that boys club and other people who had money who sponsored me as a kid, I, w I wouldn't be who I am. The work that I'm doing now with the Glover Village, that's what life is really about. I go to heaven, they ain't gonna be asking me how many times you came to the heavyweight champ in the world. He gonna ask, what did you do for the people? The reason why you exist in the world to help somebody, not just for yourself. One of my best friends was Muhammad Ali. Muhammad's health started failing and had to pick a, a new Goodwill ambassador. It was Evander, and then Evander got... brought in Mike. And he brought, you brought him in? Yep. Vander Holyfield has been very gracious of Mike. Mike bit a portion of his ear off. That takes a lot of compassion, a lot of love in your heart to forgive someone. If you forgive, then you'll have peace. You won't have people fighting each other all the time. That's what make the world go around is people forgive. What did you think when Evander called you and said, I want you to get involved in this project? Well, it's not like I was doing anything, of course, you know. I just said, hey, um, yeah, okay. Well, Mike always talked about that he never wanted to be involved in the sport again. But now that he's resurrected himself, you see him going back to boxing, establishing his own promotional company to not only help the young boxers develop into good boxers, but to help them not make some of the bad choices that he made. I was very critical of Mike. I'm happy to see him at a place where I think he's much more at peace and in a better place in his life than I've ever seen him. The Mike Tyson that's there right now is an honest guy trying to do the best he can to be happy and live a good life. His core love of boxing stems from the amateurs. That's when it was all about the love of the game. It wasn't so much about money. And that's when boxing and the sport is at its purest. It's the adversity that you face as a boxer that really brings out the true champion. Bernard and Mike and Evander, all of them have faced that kind of adversity inside the ring to be sure, but outside the ring as well. And I don't think we can measure the arc of some of these people until we see them go through the adversities. And when they do, it takes a lot to come back from it. The one thing that I think keeps them coming back both in the boxing ring and in life is the fact that boxers have perseverance. I'm on a different mission now that some ain't gonna like, and they shouldn't. What I would like to do in my second half of life is to raise what they would proceed to be hell amongst the people that want to keep a society of prey to exist so they can take advantage of the backs and blood and tears of the fighter. We need to start thinking about things in the long term, and I think some of that responsibility falls on those that interact with the fighters on a more day-to-day -day basis. There's one particular fighter that has really stepped out in front, and that's Bernard Hopkins. Being a part of Golden Boy Promotion, what I want to do is to take every fighter that comes through me. You got to have your own accountant. You got to have your own attorney. You got to know what the business is about. This was the sport of kings. This sport changed history, man. This, this sport had more to do with the advancement of the civil rights movement than any other sport. From Jack Johnson to Joe Lewis to Muhammad Ali. This is a sport that is ingrained in the fabric of this country. I think that resurgence is possible, but there has to be some changes made. The ultimate opponent for a fighter is truth. If he can be truthful with himself, if he can look at his limitations and then work on them. If he can understand what he does well and then enhance it. But he has to deal in truth. When you lose, you can only blame yourself. Go back and just look at what you did wrong. It's the ones that, that know how to lose and make yourself better and come back. That's boxing. In boxing, you have to have challenges, and you use those challenges to take it to a different level. I'm a fighter. 
I'm that type of guy that could have been anything else in my life if I chose to be that. We all have talent in us. You just gotta find it. Everybody's tested in one way or another. It ain't easy. Your pride has gotta be lined up. I have just as many distractions as somebody else, but I really wanted to be great. Victory is how you able to inspire people to want to be better. It all comes down to family, love and forgiveness and respect, bridging the gap between who I am and who I want to be. I'm going to find different ways of becoming more conscious about myself. Human beings think a lot of themselves, you know, to think that we'll be that privileged to see the end of the world. I don't think we're going to have that privilege. You know, I know there are things that happen bad, but we have to look at all the good that's happening out here. I see a new birth in the world. I see people respecting people more. We have to evolve. This is a great world. And it's the best deal we ever got in our life, you know? Life itself, we got it for nothing. Look at all we get in return.